So good evening to everyone. My name is Leslie. I'm one of the marketing representatives here at Rothman Orthopedics. I want to thank all of you for taking time out of your busy schedules and your uh, dinner plans to join us for tonight's lecture. Um, tonight we have Dr. Evan Conti. He is a sports surgeon with us. He sees patients out of two of our office locations, our Hamilton office and our Pennington office. Tonight, the topic of our lecture is cartilage restoration of the knee. Uh, know your options. So uh, without further ado, I would like to formally introduce Dr. Conti. I'm going to allow him to share his screen and begin the presentation. As I stated before, um, we will not be able to hear you if you have any questions throughout. I encourage you to type it in the chat box and I will be reading uh, questions off to Dr. Conti accordingly throughout the presentation. So thank you all. Um, and enjoy the presentation. Dr. Conti, the floor is yours. Thank you, Leslie, and thank you to everyone for joining us. Um, so <clears throat> I'm Evan Conti, and I am a sports medicine surgeon at Rothman Orthopedics. I am a team physician for Ryder University and also at the College of New Jersey. Um, a lot of my practice surgically is based out of Capital Health Hospital, which is a partner with Rothman Orthopedics and also Robert Wood Johnson, uh, Hamilton Hospital, and the New Jersey, Jersey Surgery Center. Uh, a little bit about me, uh, I uh, was um, at medical school at Albert Einstein in New York City. Uh, did my orthopedic training at Rutgers and, and then at the University of Virginia for sports medicine specific training. I've worked with uh, teams at Rutgers, James Madison University, Princeton University, and uh, the universities I'm currently working with. And I treat patients uh, from uh, adolescent age all the way up to uh, in the 80s. A little overview for tonight. We are going to talk a little bit about anatomy of the knee. We're going to talk about articular cartilage in general, the meniscus, um, injury to the cartilage, um, conservative treatment, surgical treatment of cartilage injury, and uh, cases. So the knee is the focus of the talk. Articular cartilage is present in the entire, um, of all of the major joints, including the shoulder, um, in the hip, in the ankle. Uh, but the knee seems to take the majority of the cartilage damage and the, uh, most of the treatment for cartilage restoration is focused on the knee for that reason. The knee is a hinge joint. Um, it, can, it is uh, formed by the femur and the tibia, which you can see in this diagram on the left side of the screen. On the end of the bone is this shiny white substance, which is the articular cartilage. There's articular cartilage on the femur, on the tibia, and on the un undersurface of the patella, which is the kneecap. And uh, this uh, substance, in addition to the meniscus, forms the cushioning system within the knee. Uh, on the right image is a uh, actual image from a dissection, and this is the tibia looking face down and the two menisci on the left and right side. Articular cartilage um, covers the bearing surfaces of the bones. It is uh, very, very smooth. Uh, it cushions the joints in addition to the menisci, and it is lubricated by synovial fluid. It is a very special tissue. It does not have a, a blood supply. It is uh, uh, nourished by the synovial fluid in the knee, which is uh, produced by the synovial cells, um, which is, uh, brings us to one of the problems with the cartilage is that when the cartilage is injured, uh, it has a very difficult time, uh, time regenerating. Uh, this is due to the poor blood supply. And essentially, most cartilage injuries or defects of cartilage are permanent. There are really two different types of pathways for injury to the articular cartilage. Uh, we uh, diagnose one as a chondral defect or lesion, and the other pathway is more of a degeneration, which over time will become an arthritic type change. The uh, chondral defect is uh, localized. It is usually traumatic or from a, a few traumatic incidents um, repetitively. And generally, it can be stable over time. Whereas a global degeneration or softening or weakening of the cartilage, uh, which is also termed chondromalacia, 
uh, it usually comprises most of the knee, although it will be localized to one section. Uh, it can be uh, some, it can be inflammatory over time as it becomes more uh, of an arthritic change and it can be progressive. In these images, you can uh, see on the left image, healthy articular cartilage on the femoral condyle, this white surrounding substance, and then in the center, a focal pink area, which is actually the exposed bone. So this would be uh, uh, called a cartilage lesion or defect. On the other image, you see the femoral condyle again, but in this um, uh, patient, there is uh, this breakdown of the cartilage into these uh, fine uh, filaments, um, which is sometimes termed uh, crab meat degenerative changes. And this is a, a chondromalacia grade three picture. We classify cartilage damage in different uh, ways. The most common is the outer ridge classification. Uh, this is important because it will help to determine treatment for you and uh, what type of uh, uh, way to progress. Uh, it is graded through four. A normal uh, uh, knee would be a grade zero. A grade one is on the top right image, which is a softening of the cartilage. You can see the cartilage looks to be in good condition, although if you take a metal probe, it can be easily dented uh, be due to that softening. A grade two would be a partial thickness injury to the cartilage. Um, and generally quite small with some fissures. And grade three um, involves deeper fissures and most of the way to the actual bone. It generally will be a little bit larger, about 1.5 square centimeters or larger. And then <clears throat> progressing on to a grade four, which would be the image on the bottom right. So here you can see uh, the femoral condyle on the top. This is the meniscus in between. This is the tibial plateau here. And then the central area, you can see a yellow color, and this is exposed bone. And there are small areas of cartilage still remaining. This would be a grade four. The meniscus is a type of cartilage. It really is a fibrocartilage. It's a different tissue altogether. Um, it functions uh, in tandem with the articular cartilage to provide the overall system for uh, distribution of the biomechanical forces through the knee to allow for those to be spread evenly. On the image on the bottom left, the, again, the tibial plateau uh, is interesting to see that the entire tibial plateau is covered by cartilage, but the meniscus overlying it actually covers, for example, on the lateral side, more than half of the cartilage. So you can see how important it is to have this intact meniscus to help with the cartilage together to provide the appropriate biomechanical cushioning. Cartilage injuries um, will present with localized pain. Uh, there will be a swelling of the joint, which is uh, called an effusion, and this, uh, or uh, sometimes called water on the knee. Um, this can be uh, a transient phenomenon where it comes and goes. Uh, there generally will be clicking, popping, or locking of the knee. This is due to the uh, uh, disturbance of the smooth gliding of the cartilage due to the defect. And there will be difficulty with activity. For example, if there's a localized lesion in one area of the knee, when that area of the knee is under pressure, for example, if the knee is bent and, and the area of cartilage damage is in the back of the knee, it may hurt uh, the patient when you're uh, standing from sitting because the knee will start in a flexed position and you'll press through it as you're standing. Conservative treatment for cartilage injury is really the first line in almost every case other than the most extreme. Uh, conservative treatment consists of multiple different uh, modalities, usually used in conjunction with each other based on uh, the patient's specific uh, uh, presentation. And we will use a combination of pharmacologic treatments such as NSAIDs, which is non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, the most common of which is ibuprofen or naproxen. We will use Tylenol. Um, injections are an option. Cortisone is uh, a treatment. Uh, so is visco, which is visco supplementation, um, an injection of a, a natural product to the knee, and also uh, something called PRP, which you may have heard. PRP is actually platelet-rich plasma. It is a collection of the venous blood from a uh, blood draw from the arm, which is then centrifuged, concentrated, and certain aspects of that concentrate are injected into the knee to provide a biological treatment. 
this is a newer uh, type treatment. Uh, it is generally not covered by insurance and it is still somewhat investigation. An unloader brace is, uh, can also be used. This is a type of knee brace that will help to move the pressures of body weight from one side of the knee to the other side to offload a, a damaged and painful area. Physical therapy is certainly a major aspect of non-operative treatment. Strengthening of the muscles around the knee uh, will help to uh, improve function. Um, it will also help to balance the uh, uh, muscle <clears throat> pressure through it. For example, if there's a uh, weakened quadriceps relative to a strong hamstrings that can provide a, uh, a, a detrimental uh, effect on the knee. Weight loss is very important. Um, even small amounts of weight loss can reduce the pressure through the knee and actually relieve the pain uh, by itself. Activity modification is also a consideration. Uh, for example, if a patient only has uh, pain with certain activities, such as uh, tennis or skiing, you could always consider just giving up that activity if that is uh, appropriate to you. On the top here, we can see a few images of what an unloader brace looks like. Um, these x-rays of the knee are actually more Sorry, of an Dr. arthritic Consing, situation. So this is a little bit different, but quick. the concept is the same. On the top left x-ray, you can see a knee joint here with uh, contact or pressure between the femur and the tibia of narrowing. So in this case, this would be an arthritic type picture where there's actually uh, loss of the cartilage. But what will happen is if you put an unloader brace on, it allows for a lateral motion of the tibia. And in the same patient with the x-ray, you can see here on the side, the brace is on, that there is an opening of that section of the knee. And this general concept can be used for a cartilage lesion as well. The bottom image, uh, these are different types of hyaluronic acid or visco supplementation injections. Um, that can be uh, performed to the knee. This will usually be in a series of three uh, with a one week interval. These are a natural product which has been uh, produced in a laboratory and then will be injected uh, to provide a, a lubrication or cushioning uh, effect in addition to a reduction of inflammation. We will generally attempt somewhere between three to six months of conservative treatment um, uh, for a cartilage lesion uh, based on individual uh, uh, patients and the type of lesion, the size, et cetera. An MRI will be uh, ordered uh, usually in, at this time to characterize the lesion in terms of size, location, and depth. If these different methods uh, are unsuccessful, and uh, do not provide appropriate uh, relief of pain, mechanical symptoms, and swelling, then surgical treatment will be indicated and uh, discussed. Cartilage okay. surgical treatment um, is broad. Um, the goals overall are symptom relief, relief of pain, uh, congruence of the joint, or restoration of that smooth surface on the end of the bone, and also um, to prevent additional deterioration, uh, which is very important. Uh, there are five procedures which are uh, currently uh, uh, used. Um, they uh, are in a spectrum, uh, the first of which is called a chondroplasty or debridement surgery. Uh, there is also marrow stimulation with or without uh, augmentation, which is a newer aspect of this. Um, this is also known as a microfracture. Uh, there is osteochondral autograft transplantation osteochondral allograft transplantation, and autologous chondrocyte implantation, which is a cell-based treatment. Uh, there are uh, uh, abbreviations for these um, uh, treatments, which you see in the, to the right. Um, these uh, you may come across on the internet if you're searching for different treatments, uh, such as OAT, or known as OATS, osteochondral allograft um, is known as the OCA, and the current type of um, autologous chondrocyte implantation is known as a MACI or MACI. Operative treatment is really uh, a spectrum. If you really think about it uh, from the big picture, uh, there is a current or almost an older generation of treatment and now a newer uh, generation. And the, uh, these move from more of a palliative 
to a reparative to a restorative um, goal. Uh, a, more of a, a just a historical treatment. One of the original treatments for this type of uh, damage was an arthroscopic lavage, which is a, a arthroscopic surgery with a camera with uh, saline fluid in the, in the knee, which essentially just washes out the the knee um, and removes some of the uh, different. Uh, factors in the synovial fluid that can cause pain. Uh, debridement, chondroplasty, and microfracture surgeries are more of a reparative type uh, surgery where these uh, look to try to do something to provide pain relief and mechanical improvement of the actual cartilage lesion. Uh, subchondral drilling is an improved type version of microfracture. Osteochondral autograft or mosaicplasty moves towards the restorative or more durable long-term type treatment uh, which can be performed. The newest uh, treatments are uh, enlarged osteochondral allografting. This has actually been around for a, a while, even 30 years, but the new methods of use of this and the new availability of, um, of tissue for allografting has um, improved significantly in the past 10 years. Uh, so I really consider it kind of a new generation in terms of the way that it is used. Um, ACI and Macy. ACI, the autologous chondrocyte implantation, has really been around since uh, the late 80s into the 90s um, through different generations. We're currently in the third generation, which we will discuss in a bit. Uh, and that specifically is titled Macy and is actually produced only by one company, which is FDA approved in the United States. Decision making for cartilage surgery is really about demand matching. What we mean by demand matching is trying to determine which of those types of treatments for a patient who has a failed non-operative treatment is correct based on their specific type of cartilage lesion and their goals. Um, a symptomatic patient will need to have realistic expectations. Um, a absolutely large lesion, um, even with the best treatment, um, may not allow a patient to go back to a very high level, high demand uh, type activity, such as a professional sport. Uh, patients with higher BMIs or body mass index, even with appropriate treatment, may still have pain just due to the pressure through the knee. And there's also an important aspect of willingness to comply with the post-operative protocol. Postoperative protocol is um, extensive, it is long. Um, this is due to the fact that cartilage is a very delicate tissue and needs to be protected and nurtured during its maturation from the surgery. Uh, so a patient will need to be ready, willing, have a support structure to um, go through this process, which can take even six or nine months. The characteristics of each individual cartilage lesion are very, very important to determine treatment. Um, we are usually looking at a full thickness um, grade three or four type lesion uh, for consideration of surgery. It generally will be um, over two square centimeters. Um, this is more important for the newer type of procedures such as Macy and, and uh, osteochondral allograft with a large donor uh, uh, source. Uh, in general, 55 to 60 is a good rule of thumb as the upper uh, cutoff for age, although with some treatments, in particular patient situations, we can certainly consider treatments a little bit over 60 on a, a very um, uh, uh, specific basis. Um, for example, uh, studies have been done looking at uh, 31,000 patients by Dr. Curl um, with knee pain and swelling. 63% uh, of those patients had a actual lesion of the cartilage or a chondromalacia, but of those patients, only 5% met the criteria when discussed with their surgeon to undergo a cartilage type surgery. Concomitant procedures are different procedures other than actual restoration of the cartilage that needs to be considered um, in at the either at the same time as the cartilage surgery or uh, either just before or right after. Uh, it, they are absolutely cr uh, crucial to address. The major ones that we consider are meniscal deficiency, mechanical uh, malalignment, and ligamentous instability. Meniscal deficiency 
is a tear or absence of the meniscus in uh, one section or all of the meniscus. Uh, and as we discussed before, looking at the images of the knee, uh, the meniscus is critical to work together in tandem with the cartilage to provide the cushioning. If you are missing a large section of the meniscus and the cartilage and you only replace one, uh, that surgery will not work because that will, the repaired tissue will undergo uh, uh, increased pressure from the loss of the other uh, tandem tissue. So in patients who have a large cartilage lesion but also have a missing section or the entire meniscus, it is uh, critical to also do a transplantation of a new meniscus in order to protect uh, the, the cartilage. Mechanical malalignment is also very important. This refers to the overall alignment of pressure through the knee. For example, on the image on the top right, uh, when assessed by the surgeon in this x-ray of the knee, most of the pressure was going through where this line is right here. This is an alignment that is assessed from the hip to the knee to the ankle, and a corrective procedure, which involves generally an osteotomy of the knee or a, a surgical-induced uh, fracture of the knee, and then a movement of one of the bone, of one area of the bone relative to the other, which is then fixed in place, and you can see in this bottom image, now, due to this wedge that has been uh, um, made in the bone, um, the alignment is straight through the knee. What this does is balance the pressure from this area here in this medial compartment and allows more of the pressure to be offloaded to this lateral compartment, which is likely healthy and with good cartilage and good meniscus. Ligamentous instability refers uh, to uh, injury of one of the ligaments, which are uh, uh, connective tissue, uh, essentially like a rope on the side or in the center of the knee, which allows for the two bones to stay in alignment with each other, other through a range of motion. If, you're, if you have a significant injury of one of the ligaments, this will allow for the knee to overpressure one side and uh, if this is not corrected and there is a cartilage procedure in that area, then it can fail because of the uh, lack of balance of pressure throughout the knee. So essentially what we're looking to do is to normalize the knee, reduce other um, areas of, of potential problems at the same time as the cartilage procedure. And this is something that we will discuss in the office prior to uh, indicating a patient for a cartilage surgery. And the image on the left here, you can see one of the uh, concomitant procedures. This is a ACL reconstruction with a new ACL, which has been placed in, in the knee, providing stability and support between the tibia on the bottom here and in the background, the femur. On the image on the right, this is an osteotomy. In this case, this is a tibial tubercle osteotomy, which is performed for uh, improved uh, stability of the kneecap and to offload the pressure through the kneecap section of the knee joint. Knee arthroscopy is a central procedure to uh, um, most sports medicine and certainly in, uh, uh, for cartilage, uh, it is critical. This is because we can get uh, a very good picture with an MRI of what is wrong, but there's nothing be better than directly looking at the knee with the high definition camera um, that we have during the arthroscopy. So you can see on the right, uh, you can see under the kneecap very well, and you can see on the trochlea, which is this section of the, of the femur, and in both the medial and lateral compartments of the knee. And essentially, you can see almost all of the articular cartilage um, quite well, and you can also characterize the damage uh, uh, to a much more specific level. So the first treatment that we'll discuss is chondroplasty or debridement. Um, this is a procedure which is done during an arthroscopy where a surgeon will take an instrument to, de to remove unstable sections of the cartilage. So it's more of a removal or smoothing surgery. Uh, a unstable flap of cartilage, for example, of this piece of cartilage is, is loose and hanging down. This can be trimmed off. On the image of the right, on the right, where this is more of a chondromalacia, such as a grade three with those uh, the softening and, and uh, crab meat type changes. This can simply be treated by using this device called the shaver where we just remove those loose sections of tissue. This is a same day surgery. It generally is quite quick. It can take even 15 or 20 minutes and is outpatient. And recovery is usually also uh, uh, quick, maybe a few weeks to uh, a month to two months at, at most. 
during the surgery, the uh, when the cartilage is removed, there's a pretty good short-term benefit for most patients. 50 to 70 percent of patients will see a, a quite good short-term benefit. Um, the rehabilitation, as I said, is quite quick, um, but it is a more limited and basic surgery. It is not reparative. We are not restoring or putting anything back in the defect of the cartilage. It, it does leave exposed the subchondral bone, um, and it's unknown if leaving this long term will lead to further damage of adjacent cartilage or the meniscus. Uh, we definitely do see that, but it doesn't happen in all patients. On the image here on the left, this is a chondroplasty where a cartilage lesion is full thickness. You can see the bone exposed in the center of the femoral condyle. Um, in this surgery, what we're doing is removing unstable flaps and providing good vertical walls, which help to uh, shoulder the lesion and help um, to, even though there's a defect, allow for cushioning. On the right, again, a more of a softening or smoothing procedure to any uh, loose cartilage. The next procedure we'll talk about is uh, broadly termed marrow stimulation, but commonly known as a microfracture or a micro drilling. Uh, it can also be done as an abrasion arthroplasty where a device will scrape the edge of the bone and allow for bleeding. What we're doing in this case is actually allowing for a natural healing response from the bone. Allowing the bone marrow to come out by making either small holes or by scratching the surface allows for a production of a type of repair tissue to fill in that actual pothole there. And the images on the bottom, this is a microfracture. There is a special uh, sharp pick which is used to penetrate into the bone and allow for the bone marrow to leak out. Uh, the pros are that it is very inexpensive. Um, it is not technically demanding to the surgeon. Um, there is very low surgical morbidity. Um, it has a a long track record is one of the early uh, treatments that was offered for cartilage lesions, and it is quite good actually in the short term. The problems with this uh, treatment is that really it is inferior uh, in terms of the type of tissue that is formed in the repair. The tissue that's formed in the repair is more of a repair fibrocartilage. Um, it is not very durable. Uh, it is a good surgery for a relatively small lesion, generally under two and a half or two centimeters with good shoulders, uh, will do well with a microfracture in the right patient. These images uh, demonstrate uh, what is going on biologically quite well. These small holes are formed, which penetrate here into the spongy area of the bone. In this area of the bone, there is bone marrow. Cells are present, which can migrate into this uh, clot that forms, in addition to growth factors, and allow for a restoration of a repair tissue, which is on the bottom right. Uh, this is a microscopic picture, bone on the bottom, and a reparative red cartilage on the top. Outcomes are relatively good. You'll see most of our clinical uh, studies show that most patients have good to excellent results for about two to three years. And then there is a steady creep or deterioration in terms of uh, the outcome. Uh, young patients tend to do better. Smaller size lesions are, uh, tend to do better as well. And a short duration of, of pain or symptoms uh, generally does well, usually less than 12 months. It's been uh, a type of treatment for uh, professional athletes for a, a while. Uh, most of the studies on um, athletes in the uh, National Football League or in the uh, NBA show a good ability to return to play, at least for some seasons, but then a deterioration, again, around two, three, or four years. Moving on to... Um, uh, the new, newer generations, such as the large osteochondral allografting and uh, ACI and Macy, which is going to be a, a bit of the focus on this talk. Uh, osteochondral autograft mosaic plasty or OATS is simply a transfer of bone and cartilage from one area of the knee to an area of the knee which is deficient. So on this image, we use a special device to core out a section of, of cartilage from usually the trochlea, which is at the top of the knee joint, and, and put that cartilage in a mosaic pattern um, into the femoral condyle. Uh, 
it seems counterintuitive, but the uh, idea is that certain areas of the, of the cartilage do not receive the same amount of pressure and uh, would tolerate a missing section of cartilage better than other areas. So that is the idea of this. It does very well with smaller, uh, medium-sized lesions, generally one to three centimeters, probably more to one to two in my experience. Uh, younger patients and uh, patients with lower BMIs do uh, much better. It is contraindicated or recommended against if you have an inflammatory arthro uh, arthritis of the knee. Uh, kissing lesions means lesions of cartilage on both one and the other side directly touching and patients who uh, cannot follow the protocol for recovery. Here are some images of an actual uh, mosaic plasty, where in this case, two plugs have been placed uh, adjacent to each other to restore cartilage to this um, oval-shaped defect. Uh, results are good. They're certainly better than microfracture. Um, it essentially comes down to if the surgery is performed well, such that the, the plug is placed flush with the adjacent cartilage, um, the results can be uh, durable and, uh, and um, long-lasting. Osteochondral allograft is a very similar concept. It is also um, a, a plug or bone and cartilage hybrid graft. Uh, it was initially developed in the 70s, but it certainly has had a, a major expansion in the past 10 years. Um, what we're doing in this case is actually uh, like a tissue transplant similar to, for example, a kidney transplant. But in this case, because the chondrocytes, the, the actual cells within the cartilage, um, are immunoprivileged, which means that because of the uh, lack of the blood supply, um, your body cannot really see that it is a different person's cells. So we take advantage of that uh, property um, and allow for those cells to be transplanted into the patient um, without uh, worrying much about rejection. Rejection is theoretically possible, but it is mostly related to the bone side. The bone will over time be replaced with the bone of the patient, but the cartilage will uh, stay behind. Uh, the limitations of this are is that it is scarce. We're, um, we need to actually find cartilage and bone from another person. Um, it is expensive, and sometimes there can be incomplete incorporation of the bone. Uh, these graphs are available fresh, which means they're just simply refrigerated. They can also be frozen, and they are cryopreserved. The fresh uh, preserve the highest percentage of live chondrocytes. Uh, so the viability and the long-term duration of that graft would be best, and that is generally what I um, uh, use for my patients. Uh, and in, in very interesting type surgery because that cartilage will remain alive and live on for many, many years. Here is an example of a surgery involving a, um, a large allograft. One of the major benefits is that we can obtain entire, an entire aspect of the knee. For example, on this image on the left, this is a femoral condyle in its entirety. You can even get the entire um, end of the femur bone involving both condyles and the trochlea if you want. Uh, this allows uh, for the surgeon to restore one area, two areas, or even more within the same knee from just one graft. Uh, so it is quite beneficial for patients who have larger areas of cartilage damage. On the image on the right, this is an MRI. This is a sagittal image, which is a, a lateral from the side looking at the femur here on the top, the tibia on the bottom, this black triangle with the arrow. This is actually the meniscus, but this right here is the transplant. So you'll see this is where this, was, this section of bone was removed. The section in the center is from uh, the donor. And along this edge, this gray color coming around the curve, this is actually the new cartilage. The outcomes for an osteochondral allograft are very, very good. Um, if the surgery is done uh, technically well, if there is no rejection of the bone or reaction, then the graft can be very, very durable. Uh, many years of, uh, a good symptom relief can be expected. Some studies even show over 10 or 15 years, uh, even up to 20 years from some studies out of England, uh, that the graphs have been uh, viewed again during a second look 
arthroscopy and look essentially the way they looked when they were implanted many, many years ago. Uh, some, this uh, can uh, have a higher risk of failure in bipolar or the kissing lesions where there are two adjacent areas of cartilage that need to be restored. And again, if there is limb malalignment or in patients under workman's compensation, generally do not do as well. We move on now to autologous chondrocyte implantation in Macy, which is a very exciting new uh, treatment. Um, which has been approved in the, in the United States in the past few years, this third generation. The prior generations of ACI have been approved uh, for uh, much longer. This is a cell-based treatment. So what's interesting about this treatment is that it involves um, using your own cartilage cells and then um, having these grown in a laboratory to expand the amount of cells and activate the cells, and then they are reimplanted into your knee. So it is your own body and your own tissue that which is being um, essentially engineered and returned to you. Um, it does form a, a different type of repair than, for example, the microfracture. This is a hyaline like. It is not exactly the same as the original hyaline or articular cartilage um, that was present at that site before, but it is very similar and much more similar than fiber cartilage. This also allows for uh, improved uh, uh, mechanical um, aspects of the repair site and durability. It is very versatile. It essentially can treat almost any size lesion and in any location of the knee. For example, uh, surgeons will uh, generally have increased technical difficulty with lesions on the patella or the kneecap just due to the shape or on the trochlea, which is the area of the femur that the kneecap articulates with. Uh, and the ACI or MACI is very, very uh, effective for these areas because it can conform to those uh, changes in the shape quite well. Um, is it does have some disadvantages. Uh, you do have to have healthy surrounding cartilage. It is a two-stage surgery. So this is one of the only surgeries that we discussed that is actually two stages because it initially requires a biopsy, which uh, can be done arthroscopically through small incisions in a minimally-invasive way. Um, and a, the actual implantation will be performed uh, usually about four to six weeks after the initial surgery. The three generations, the first was uh, covered with periosteum, which is actually a connective tissue which lines the bones. Um, this was technically uh, challenging. There was also problems with uh, uh, taking that lining off of the bone and uh, pain that can be associated with. So the second generation was to attempt to do this cartilage um, cell-based treatment without having to take the periosteum. A collagen uh, membrane was developed. Um, which was less uh, morbid of a surgery. And now we have the benefit of the newest generation, which is the matrix assisted or the, the Macy, uh, which uses a, a, a biologic scaffold, which will dissolve over time and allow for those cells to grow into the defect. So here's an example of early generation ECI. Here's a femoral condyle with a full thickness lesion centrally, and that periosteal uh, type patch is sewn over it with these small blue sutures. Underneath this patch is injected the cells. The problem is, and you can almost see it on this image, that there's an uneven distribution. Some areas of that uh, cell-based liquid may concentrate in some spot, but then not fill one area, and that can lead to uneven growth of the cells. The benefit of the newer uh, surgery, which is the Macy, is that the cells are very uniformly distributed on this membrane, and the uh, resultant growth of the new cartilage in the defect is very predictable. Um, as the current outcome studies are very, very good and very promising for this technology. It is currently FDA approved for moderate to large lesions, which are defined as greater than two square centimeters. They will need to be full thickness and associated with pain and impaired function. And a non-operative treatment is generally uh, needs to be attempted before uh, consideration of the surgery. It is currently FDA approved for patients 18 to 55 years of age. Um, uh, it is able to be performed, uh, sorry, patients will need to uh, 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 strictly adhere to the rehabilitation, which is of all of these surgeries, the most uh, techni or technically difficult uh, because it's very, very rigorous. It is very specific. Uh, a good physical therapy team will be required. 
here's an overview of the Macy procedure um, in a patient with the defects, such as this one on the femoral condyl. Cartilage will be biopsied or taken from these yellow areas of the knee, again, in areas where there is uh, very um, limited uh, contact, um, which can be well tolerated. The cells are then uh, shipped to a laboratory and expanded or grown. And when the implant is ready, it will uh, be implanted through a small arthrotomy or actual full incision to fully visualize the defect and implant the tissue. Uh, here's an overview again of what happens over time. So, and the image here on the right, this is a full thickness lesion. Here's the cartilage. The yellow is the bone on the bottom. The membrane is in and the cells are in. Initially, it is lower down and the cartilage is surrounding it. Over time, the cells will start to grow and eventually fill all the way to the top of the defect. It is useful for uh, treating lesions of the femoral condyle on the lateral or medial side, on the kneecap, the patella, and also on the trochlea. It can be used even with some small amounts of bone involvement, but generally one of the uh, difficulties is that, uh, and downsides of Macy is that it does not do well if there is also a lesion or a poor quality of the bone just underneath that missing cartilage. The recovery and the maturation is over six to nine months. So the process is essentially to uh, remove, uh, return function of the knee in terms of motion and strength, um, allow for uh, from initial limited weight bearing to full weight bearing, and then protect this healing tissue as the knee cartilage remodels and matures. And it is essentially uh, finished with its maturation process around nine months. Meniscus allograft transplantation is a surgery that we do in addition to the cartilage surgery, as we discussed. Uh, essentially, we'll put a meniscus into the knee from another person. This will be um, a frozen. It is not actually alive, but still functions quite well. It does um, uh, help in those circumstances where a, a missing meniscus uh, would prevent um, uh, the normal cushioning effect. So uh, this will be done at the same time as the cartilage surgery. And these do have good to excellent results, uh, but uh, uh, the patients do need to be counseled. Uh, significant athletic activity can be difficult, such as returning to a high level college sport or a professional sport that certainly will not do well long-term. This is more of a, uh, allow, a, a surgery to allow patients to be fit and healthy. So here's actually what it looks like during surgery. A, um, a section of a bone cartilage with the attached meniscus is uh, obtained, and then uh, the meniscus is, and bone is prepared. Um, one way to do it is to leave small sections of bone attached to the meniscus, and then in, uh, uh, place these within the patient's bone to restore those two, we call roots, and then the meniscus will be sutured along and implanted. Rehabilitation for cartilage surgery is generally slow and long. Uh, for most of the uh, surgeries, other than for Macy, it is about six months. There will be a period of limited weight bearing with crutches. A hinge knee brace will be required, uh, which you can see here. Uh, we use uh, cryotherapy, which is a, a cold, uh, 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 essentially ice water system that pumps ice water through a, a hose into a pad over the knee to help control swelling and pain. A CPM or continual passive motion machi machine is frequently used, uh, which can be seen on the bottom image. It essentially will move your knee for you uh, to allow for that uh, uh, return of both flexion and extension. Physical therapy is the mainstay, uh, and essentially a good relationship with a physical therapist who has experience with cartilage procedures is essential for an appropriate outcome. Now on to a few cases and then I will take questions. Um, so the, these are my cases. These are our patients. Um, the first one is a 33-year-old former college hockey player currently playing in a local hockey league. Um, as you can see here, unfortunately, uh, he had a, a large section of the meniscus, which was torn and debrided from a prior surgery. There's also a weakened area of cartilage defect just adjacent to it. He was taken to surgery after failing non-operative treatments. Here you can see, again, weakening the cartilage uh, slightly on the tibial side, but mostly on the femoral side. Here's the deficient meniscus. 
and then in this case we are preparing and then implanting a new meniscus. This is an allograft transplantation. Here's the new meniscus in the knee with the sutures here, and uh, you can see here a big uh, uh, overview of the area that the meniscus was transplanted. Uh, take note uh, on the image on the left of the entirety of the tibial plateau here, this cartilage is exposed all the way to the edge and we, with the new meniscus we're able to cover it uh, the way that the normal anatomy should be. In this patient, there was an area of just some softening of the cartilage, but there was one full thickness defect here, and the surrounding cartilage was starting to uh, become loose and form flaps. So this one area here where there's more weight bearing, much less weight bearing up here, uh, underwent an osteochondral allograft transplant with this plug here. So you can see this bright shiny white plug that has been placed in and is now flush with the cartilage. This is a Macy case. This is a 20-year-old college basketball player who unfortunately had significant kneecap-related pain, had tried non-operative treatment for many months with physical therapy and anti-inflammatory medicines. We did injections. Um, we tried uh, as many modalities as we could. Um, she did not do well, and then she was indicated for a treatment with Macy. This is an image of the cartilage um, with the knee actually exposed here. Here's a metal probe. You can see that there's a large full thickness lesion. This entire area here is a flap. It is just lifting straight off of the bone and providing no appropriate cushioning here. And uh, this leads to significant pain and swelling. This is prepared. So this will be prepared by removing the surrounding cartilage that also has uh, flaps that are unstable. The key is to obtain these good, healthy, stable walls around the defect. We will use a, a special device to cut a, a, a geometric shape if possible because this is the most stable, an oval in this case. And then here is the actual Macy. The Macy is the membrane that has been placed here and glued into the defect. We use a fibrin glue, which is a biological glue, which will hold that membrane in those cells in while those cells adhere to the subchondral bone, which you can see. And here's the last case. This is a large or um, osteochondral allograft case. It's an interesting case of a woman who came to see us for uh, uh, a a significant amount of clicking and popping of her knee, which has been present for many years, even uh, 10 to 15 years she had just lived with it. But it eventually got to the point where uh, uh, almost all athletic activities were limited. She was having trouble even um, uh, with activities of daily living. She was having substantial popping and catching of the knee, especially in deep flexion where this uh, lesion was. And here on the arthroscopic image, you can see that there is a bumpy appearance to the cartilage. In this case, this also involves the subchondral bone, which is why it has this uh, very unusual appearance. Adjacent to this, just on the side of the bone, was actually a missing section of bone and cartilage, or a loose body, which was removed. In this patient, the loose body was actually quite large. Um, it was almost the size of a, of a half dollar. And then during the surgery, uh, we were able to expose this area of the defect and then perform the osteochondral allograft transplant. We obtained an entire femoral condyle, which was matched to the correct side, left and right for the patient, and to the shape and normal size of her defect. Here is the before, and here is the after with the restorative uh, treatment with a new cartilage and a small piece of bone. So from this bumpy appearance, we're able to achieve smooth motion and improve pain. Um, this uh, patient underwent six months of postoperative care with braces, with a brace, crutches, and physical therapy, and then returned to essentially all activities that she wanted to, including recreational athletics. And that concludes our talk for this evening. Um, thank you very, very much. Uh, these are the offices that I currently work at in both uh, Hamilton and in Pennington. And uh, we do um, uh, perform surgery at Capital Health Hospital, also Robert Wood Johnson and the New Jersey Service. Wonderful, thank you, Dr. Conti. I do have several questions that came through on this end. Can you hear me okay? Leslie, I'm having some trouble actually hearing you. Okay. Um, just make sure the volume's up on your computer on your end. Can 
Can you hear me? Dr. Conti, I'm gonna call you and you can repeat the questions. Hi. Hi. All right, I'm gonna read. I'm can gonna hear read me? off the yes. yes. All right, a little bit of feedback. I'll try to take it just as a phone, that might reduce the feedback. Wonderful. I'm going to read off some questions to you. We did have quite a few come through. Okay. And hopefully the audience can hear us okay. Oh, I can hear you now. I think it's working. Good. Okay. Um, so many people are asking if they were told by a physician before that they have no cartilage and they mm -hmm. are indeed bone on bone, would any of these procedures work for them? Uh, probably not, unfortunately. Once you have bone, two areas of exposed bone, um, it's very difficult to treat under very limited circumstances of a localized bone-on-bone -bone lesion. You could consider certain treatments, but probably not. Okay. Um, is there any age limit set on a candidate for a cartilage restoration procedure? Well, the only one that is definitive is for Macy. Um, the FDA has only approved Macy uh, for use in the United States in patients up to 55 years of age. It is being explored to see if we can increase that. Um, but the other procedures could be considered for patients a, a bit older than 55, as long as the patient is very healthy, active, and the actual cartilage surrounding the lesion is still in quite good condition. So that would be a bit more of a specialized case but it certainly could be considered. I would think anything over 65 to 70, uh, really we're kind of getting out of the um, age that this might be successful for. Um, going back to basic gel injections for those that, for any of the questions we just asked are no longer candidates, do you um, recommend a method that is better uh, in comparison to some of the injection routes? Um, in terms of the type of the, the visco versus another type of injection or the timing? It doesn't specify. Okay. Well, generally in visco, um, there are two methods, either a one-time shot or three times, which is space over one week interval between each shot. Um, the studies show that the three injection series is better in terms of longevity of those injections. They generally will last for about six months, and you can return to get those injections every six months if you would like. And they are definitely a good option for patients who are not indicated for surgery, but still have a cartilage lesion that causes pain. And roughly how long do those visco supplementations last for any sort of injections that people receive? Uh, most of the time they last somewhere between two, three to six months. Although I have had patients that for whatever reason have told me they've had relief for 12 or even 18 months. Uh, so I think it is variable. So you, you know, it's certainly uh, reasonable to consider and then you'll essentially for your own need determine how long it lasts after you've tried. Um, as far as a weight or BMI, BMI factor for any of the surgical procedures, is there a limit on them? Uh, there, that is something that is uh, for, yes. The big, big answer is yes. It is actually interesting. Most insurance companies are starting to uh, actually uh, limit or not allow surgery if a patient is at a certain BMI. It's usually around 40, sometimes 35. So those are two goals. So certainly if, uh, and as we said, weight loss in itself is actually a treatment. So certainly trying to get under 40 to 35 is a good idea um, and would actually help your recovery anyway. Um, to that point, I will add, unfortunately, not out of any of the locations Dr. Conti's at, but we do have designated dietitians here at Hoffman Orthopedics. We have one um, out of uh, a few select New Jersey facilities and one out of some of our Philadelphia facilities. And what they do promote is actually with most insurance plans, you can are covered to see a dietitian anywhere from three to 10 free visits a year. Um, our dietitians in particular, because they specialize in orthopedic patients, a lot of their weight loss um, information and the journey that they go on with the patients is weight loss without um, exercise. So it is more diet focused. So I will just double up on that comment there. Um, let's see. Several questions coming in about 
PRP and stem cell. Obviously, I know that is limited. If you could just briefly discuss how our practice um, handles that and some of the efficacy. Yes, thank you, Leslie. So uh, the stem cell injection is uh, performed in the United States. It is very limited. The data is also um, uh, quite uh, all, all over the place. Some uh, is good, some is bad. So at, at Rothman, we are currently not offering stem cell injections uh, for the knee. Uh, we do offer PRP um, to certain patients. Uh, and you know, I would say for stem cell, you, know, you have to have a very thorough discussion with your doctor, uh, whether or not that is indicated and appropriate for you. But it is certainly not covered by insurance, which is also a consideration. Are there any physical activity, um, exercise, or running limitations to a person after they've had one of those procedures? Um, good question. So certain types of activities, depending upon what type of procedure, may be contraindicated. For example, if you have a meniscus transplant and also a cartilage procedure, and you uh, your aspirations are re to return to a very high level of uh, sports such as uh, rugby or football or anything involving contact, probably not a good idea that may damage your, uh, your repairs. Um, however, our goal in general is to maintain a healthy lifestyle such as cycling, uh, swimming, um, jogging. I would do not recommend that my patients jog uh, all the time, um, but certainly that can be incorporated to the healthy lifestyle and uh, that be very beneficial. Weight training, of course, as well. I lost you again. Can you just repeat that? Sure. Can I set up the phone? Or should we to your computer? Uh, on the phone now. All right. Hold on. Oh, there, there you go. go. You got it. You're back. There we go. All yeah. right. Uh, how thick is the meniscus and the cartilage at the end of the bone? Where do you need it to be post-surgically? What's the ideal width of that, I guess? So the thickness, the thickness. is is different in different areas of the knee. And the patella on the kneecap, it is actually the thickest. It can be five millimeters in, in some cases, uh, whereas on the end of the fem femoral condyle, um, it is maybe two to three millimeters uh, and much thinner. And the goal is generally to uh, restore that exact depth of the adjacent cartilage. Um, I believe you did mention a cadaver meniscus. Is there any sort of um, restoration or regeneration options for a patient's current meniscus damage? Uh, well, that would go under a meniscus repair. So in certain circumstances, we can repair a torn section of a meniscus, but we really do not have the technology to just replace one section within the meniscus. So generally, if the tear becomes very deep and, and almost to the uh, involving the entire meniscus, then you have to replace the entire thing. Um, so um, we, you know, some circumstances you can do the repair where you're basically taking a tear, suturing it together and allowing for it to restore. Sorry, I'm just browsing here. How much of the diagnosis relies on the size of the lesion? Um, is this determined prior to surgery with an MRI, or do you not determine until you are in the surgical procedure? Uh, almost, almost always is determined ahead of time based on the MRI. Um, although sometimes we will do something called a staging arthroscopy where we simply go in the knee with the camera as an individual procedure to characterize and measure the lesion in much more detail. Um, and the size, it really determines what, which of those options is the best for you. Um, now, what would you say you indicated that someone uh, under 55 is not a Macy candidate? If you have a very active person in their 60s, would they 
possibly be considered um, at any point or the age cutoff already deems them not for Macy candidate. Yes. Yeah, Macy is very strict because it's a newer product and it has very stringent FDA regulations. This insurance companies generally will not approve it at all over 55 for almost any reason, as far as I understand. Um, but you could be a candidate for one of the other procedures that really could um, uh, generate a very good outcome anyway. So you, that would be a discussion. Um, the hockey player that you touched base on, can you briefly talk about his outcome? Um, was he able to fully return? He's still ongoing. So he's uh, still uh, not fully recovered, but doing very well. So maybe in another talk we can discuss it. I'm sorry. Um, how long would you recommend someone getting injections before they look into some other one of these procedures? Uh, somewhere around three to six months based on the individual patient. You generally will, the attempt at conservative treatment is um, pretty substantial. Uh, the reason is a lot of patients will actually do very well with the conservative treatment and not require the surgery. So for me, uh, somewhere in the three to six month range is uh, appropriate. And do you recommend someone acting on symptoms sooner rather than later? Will the procedures get more difficult for them to recover from if they, you know, wait it until their symptoms are worse? It can. So I think that's a very good point. If you are having substantial symptoms such as swelling, clicking, popping, especially if it's new, uh, brand new as a result of a car accident or you fell down the stairs, something substantial, uh, that should be looked at right away because that, if you do have a very large um, injury, such as you tore the meniscus in a, a significant way or a larger cartilage lesion, it can damage the adjacent cartilage and meniscus. So that would do better if that was treated quicker rather than later. Would you want a patient to have an MRI completed before they come to see you, or do you prefer to be the one to evaluate and order if necessary? Either way is fine. Um, we are going to conclude tonight's uh, per um, <laughs> presentation. Um, due to time, it seems like some people are already logging off as well. I do apologize that we weren't able to get to every question. Some were just a little too specific to um, answer for the general uh, group. But if there are any continuing questions, um, again, everyone feel free to reach out to me directly. The messaging reminders for tonight's event did come from me. It's leslie.gilman at rothmanortho.com. On Dr. Conti's slide that's on the screen, that is a VIP scheduling line. If you are interested in scheduling with Dr. Conti or with any of our physicians here at Rothman, you can do so via that number. Uh, I would also encourage you to explore our website um, to learn more about our providers and locations, and that is rothmanortho.com. So thank you, Dr. Conti, and thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you. Have a great night.